Welcome to week two of our class, Political Science 329, Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Uh, before we got started on actual material this week, I wanted to take a few minutes of your time, uh, especially for those of you who have not uh, been in a class about law or um, especially constitutional law before, um, to talk about some legal basics uh, that not everybody knows. So uh, we're all on the same page uh, when we uh, start reading this stuff and discussing it. One thing that's important to understand is the road to the Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> and the road to the Supreme Court always has to come through a sort of gatekeeping function uh, called the, the Petition for Certiorari, um, or Petition for Cert. Um, and there are two ways to do that. Either a federal uh, district court ha issues an opinion, and a circuit court issues an opinion, and that is appealed. You still have to apply for the, the uh, writ, and that application is called a petition. Uh, you can also have a state Supreme Court decision um, that is uh, reviewed in the uh, Supreme Court, but that writ is only appropriate when the state Supreme Court decision hinges on, at least in part, federal law, not state law. On matters of state law, the state Supreme Courts uh, are final. When this is done, you get one set of briefs from the petitioner and the respondent and appropriate repro reply briefs there. <coughs> Excuse me, and I tell you that because when you look at SCOTUS blog, you will see a series of briefs for cases. The first set of briefs you'll see are these uh, briefs on the petition, not on the actual uh, case itself. You'll see another series of briefs that comes later. Then, in the uh, 150 or so cases that are granted uh, the writ of cert, um, you have um, to understand that at least four of the nine justices have to agree to hear the case. And many times, um, you will not hear a case based on political reasons. So you may think uh, that you actually agree with what petitioner is saying, but you know your colleagues don't, and so you don't vote to hear the case. Uh, these decisions all happen in conference. All we know um, is what comes out of them, the end result. We don't know the deliberations. We don't know how the vote breaks down, anything like that. Um, but, unless unless somehow that comes out, but uh, we do know if there is a writ issued. Uh, if there is a writ issued, the briefing schedule is set. You'll have a petitioner's brief, and the petitioner is the person who is appealing the decision below. The respondent is the party who wants to keep whatever the last decision was. Uh, oral argument is set and occurs, and then the justices meet again in conference and decide how they're going to decide how they're going to decide the case. Um, and the opinion writers are set. If the chief justice is in the majority, he can write the decision or assign it by seniority or any other way he sees fit. Uh, if the chief justice is not in the majority, the senior member of the majority uh, issues the opinion or assigns who will issue the opinion. Um, so many times in our court today, uh, the people who are deciding who gets to write the opinions uh, are uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice uh, Ginsburg. And just based on the breakdown of how the five to four decisions usually go or the six to three. Then you have decision day when the decision is issued. Sometimes the justices will read their opinions from the bench. They will not usually read the whole thing, but only portions of it. If they do this, um, this is a strong statement as to how they feel about the case. Um, they feel it's important enough to warrant this. Um, and so you may see this in highly politically charged cases. There are a few constraints on judicial power that you should be aware of, and they fall into two broad categories for our purposes. Uh, the first is just stickability. It's a funny word. Spell check will never uh, recognize it, just so you know. Um, but generally speaking, it's whether a case is suitable for the court hearing it. Um, so these are the rules of just stickability. Courts cannot issue advisory opinions. You can't go to a court uh, <clears throat> as a member of a legislative branch in the United States and say, hey, if we were to enact this law, would this be constitutional? Our court system will not hear that case. 
other countries actually do hear such cases, and there are countries that that's built into the, the uh, process of, of actually passing a law. So uh, France, for example, has their Supreme Court issue an advisory opinion on a law before it becomes a law. Uh, collusive suits are not allowed. This is where the parties are just testing out the law to prove a point or test out the law. Uh, if that appears to be the case, the court will not hear the case. A case cannot be moot, uh, and some of you might know this because we use the term, it's a moot point in uh, daily conversation, but mootness is when something in the underlying facts means that the case has been already settled or events have already passed, there's nothing the court can do to address the situation, the time has passed. Uh, on the other hand, a case must be ripe. Um, so you cannot bring a case before harm occurs, um, even if it th even if you think harm is very likely. Uh, the only thing you can do is bring a case if it's imminent. So if it's just you think it's likely, even if that likely is 99%, um, you cannot bring a case. You have to wait until an action occurs. So um, if I know, for example, that someone is going to publish an article defaming me, uh, next week, if the New York Times calls and says they're going to publish an article defaming me, um, I cannot sue until that article is published um, unless I have an indication that they're definitely going to publish it, then I could sue and try and get an injunction. Um, and then finally, political questions are not just stickable. If something is better left to the executive branch, uh, like a matter of administrative law or determining uh, you know, what types of particles uh, are pollutants under certain law, uh, that should go to that branch and not to uh, the judicial branch. Finally, the parties in a case must have standing. I cannot bring a case where I don't have standing to sue. What you have to show is that you uh, have an injury or imminent danger of an injury, uh, an injury that is traceable to the acts uh, or act of a defendant or defendants, and that a favorable court decision for me would provide a remedy or some sort of compensation for the energy or injury. Uh, if you cannot show that, you do not have standing to sue. So you have to be involved in the case. You can't just be a bystander. Now, a couple of uh, important cases that help show us the parameters uh, that we just talked about. The first is Marbury versus Madison. And here is a short video uh, on the background of that case. Jefferson was building a country and he had a very extended vision of where things were going to go. And I think he became pretty hardcore about people who got in the way. And he saw Marshall as someone who was getting in the way. The swearing-in of Thomas Jefferson has got to be one of the great ironic moments in American history because you have Chief Justice Marshall uh, swearing in his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson, and both men pretty much by that time hated one another. They feel that the policies represented by the other person was detrimental to American civilization. It was as fundamental as that. So you have Marshall holding the Bible, Jefferson swearing to uphold the Constitution, which Marshall was absolutely sure he was going to destroy. The first fight between Jefferson and Marshall was a fight picked by John Adams on his way out of town. That quarrel would spill into the United States Supreme Court. On paper, Marbury versus Madison involved a small technical question of administrative housekeeping. But in the political swirl of 1801, this seemingly straightforward legal case would determine the future of the court and test the cunning and ability of the new 45-year-old Chief Justice. Marbury versus Madison began with another breathtaking act of partisanship by the outgoing President John Adams. 
Just weeks before Jefferson's inauguration, the lame duck Federalist Congress had passed legislation swelling the federal courts, and Adams stuffed them full of anti-Jeffersonians. At the very end, literally the last day of Adams' presidency, he was busy signing commissions for these federal judgeships, including these justices of the peace. And the hour got very late, and he had to get the commission signed, and then they were sent over to the Secretary of State, who happened to be John Marshall. And Marshall had to put the seal of the United States on it, and then they were to be delivered to these designated justices of the peace. John Marshall knows he can't deliver them all. He gives about half of them to his brother James to deliver. Um, James doesn't get around to delivering them um, before time runs out. The key lesson of Marbury versus Madison is don't give important documents to your brother. So the Marbury versus Madison case that you just saw the facts of, um, what this means constitutionally uh, is actually impossible to understate or overstate rather. Um, this is the genesis of judicial review. Um, John Marshall knew that he was playing the long game here. The short game would have been to give uh, Marbury his post and walk away. Um, and he easily could have done that. But by invalidating a procedure of, uh, of law that was given by Congress and saying that it violated the Constitution, he was able to say that the court was ultimately the arbiter of what is and is not constitutional. Um, and that line, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Uh, if you go and visit the Supreme Court building, uh, that is inscribed by the statue of John Marshall. So ultimately what the court said is that it has the power to review the acts of Congress, uh, that all legislation passed through Congress ultimately has to be held up to the Constitution, and that the body holding it up to the Constitution to see if it meshes is the Supreme Court. Um, so it actually uh, comes down to the judiciary winning here, um, and specifically the Supreme Court. This is an important case, not just because it sets up judicial review, but it also sets up um, how important judicial review can actually be. The next case uh, that we'll talk about is Ex parte McArdle. This is a Civil War case, actually a Reconstruction case, uh, where a Southern journalist was uh, jailed um, over charges that he wrote incendiary and libelous articles about the Reconstruction process. Uh, he was held by a military uh, body and tried in a military tribunal. Uh, and since he was a citizen of the United States, he sought a writ of habeas corpus. Now, you may have heard of this uh, if you have watched any kind of legal drama. It's basically asking the federal courts to determine whether you were properly held or not. Um, and you can do this for state actions or for federal actions. Um, so he sought a writ of habeas corpus, and he did it specifically under this 1867 uh, Habeas Corpus Act. And uh, so the Supreme Court docketed this. He first went to the circuit court. The circuit court said no. It went up to the Supreme Court, who was actually pretty sympathetic to him. Um, they heard oral arguments. And before they issued an opinion, Congress changed the law, actually overturned the law, uh, and said that uh, the Supreme Court no longer has jurisdiction to hear these cases. In fact, the whole judiciary doesn't have jurisdiction to hear these cases. Um, and therefore, um, the court uh, has to grapple with the question of whether they can even hear McArdle's case. And here, unlike in Marbury versus Madison, they say that they cannot hear the case. Um, and the reason why it's different, although uh, it's the same outcome, they say both say we can't hear the case because of this procedure, is because this restricts uh, the court's ability to hear a case rather than Marbury versus Madison, which actually opened a new avenue for cases being heard with judicial review. Uh, this restricts the ability of the court to hear cases and says that Congress can actually restrict the actions of the federal courts at any time as long as that doesn't uh, conflict with the Constitution. Here, it did not. 
Um, so Mr. McArdle does not get his day in court, uh, at least not this court for this. Um, and the Supreme Court recognizes the ability of Congress to change its jurisdiction.